Hello everyone. Welcome to Software Testing Expert Talk series. Today we have a guest who has close to 15 years of experience in software development and testing in the IT industry so far. He is a test automation consultant and trainer and has worked with many big companies in his tenure so far. Currently he is holding a role of director of International Academy at one of the prestigious organization across the world. In his career he has covered everything from building and maintaining test automation solutions that works to creating and implementing test automation strategies across teams and organizations he is an experienced corporate trainer and has successfully delivered many courses on test automation to companies in the netherlands and abroad his courses are built on the experience he has gained in 15 years of being a test automation consultant so he knows what works in test automation and what does not he is a person who enjoys public speaking and has taken part in many international conferences like agile and automation days uk star dutch testing day and has delivered talks at numerous other conferences in the netherlands and abroad not only this much in his introduction he is founder of ontestautomation.com plus he is also an author of couple of ebooks named as a test automation learning path service virtualization implementation practices and trends for on demand test environments now i believe you must have got an idea about the guest for today's estate session yes our guest is none other than boss dykstra welcome to our show boss <laughs> Thank you so much AJ. I don't think I've had an an introduction that enthusiastic before. So thank you very much for that. All right. Thank you boss. Uh today boss will talk about how we can do API testing using Python. Let's hear directly from him. Over to you boss. Thank you so much AJ. Let me go I had and share my screen. All right. Um so this is a little bit of an experiment for me as well in that there are no slides. Typically when I do talks, live demos there are slides. Today there will be no slides. It will be just me talking, having a discussion with AJ and lots of live coding in between. Um as AJ already said, um what we're going to do today, what I'm going to talk about today is api testing writing tests for apis in python using the requests library and pytest um why api testing um why not um api testing is becoming ever more popular and people are finding out that writing tests at the api level um can be done efficiently results in good test coverage in and, and and because apis are ever more present in modern software applications and systems um having the skills to to interact with applications at the api level is becoming ever more important so uh, traditionally a lot of automation has been done at the ui level at the graphical user interface level but nowadays more and more of the automation work is shifting um down in the application stack more and more towards um integration testing at the api level um so that's what we're going to explore today really um the reason i've chosen python as my language of choice is because um there's not a whole lot of coding you need to do to write useful meaningful and powerful tests for your APIs. Um Python has a lot of excellent libraries that can help you write uh tests for APIs. And before I get started coding, um I'm going to quickly introduce the two main libraries that I'll be using today. First of all, um like with so many automation efforts, we need a testing framework a unit testing framework um python has a lot of different unit testing frameworks 
um, but arguably the most popular and the most versatile one is PyTest. So PyTest is currently at version 6.2.5. Um, it's a very mature framework. It's powerful and um, it's one of the most expressive unit testing frameworks I know in the Python ecosystem. So that's why we're using PyTest here. And as you've probably understood from the title of this session today, we're going to be using requests as well. Um, you can already see from the description here on the page that requests is a simple yet elegant HTTP library. Um, basically, if I had to put that in my own words, it means that um, it's powerful and it's expressive and you can write meaningful tests using requests and PyTest in Python without having to write a whole lot of code. It is simple to use, uh, but extremely powerful, as you'll hopefully see uh, once we get started writing some actual tests for our APIs. Um, if you go to the requests documentation page, uh, you'll see a lot of, uh, see uh, more about all of the features that requests can, uh, all of the features that, that requests offer. Um, I'll never be able to cover all of them in this session. So we'll get started at the beginning. I'll be showing quite a few features of the requests library, but there's no way that I'm going to be able to cover them all in just uh, about an hour, uh, which is all the time that we have. If you want to know more about, Py, uh, about uh, the request library, I highly recommend just check out the documentation. It's uh, well-written, it's easy to understand, and basically everything that the library can do is in there. Um, of course, uh, because we uh, are going to write some tests for an API, we also need an API to test against. Um, so there are thousands, if not millions of APIs available there. Uh, the one that I've chosen for the examples, for the, for the coding exercises that I'll be doing today is um, the JSON placeholder.topico.com API. That API has a number of different endpoints. It's a fake API for testing and prototyping. It has a number of different endpoints. Um, you can uh, retrieve data about posts, comments, albums, photos, to-dos. And we're going to start out with some user data. So, um, and mainly uh, the, the main operation that we're going to be focusing on is, is this one, an HTTP GET, so I'm retrieving some data from this API that is related to a user with user ID one. So as you can see in the response, there's a user ID, um, there's a name associated with that user ID, a username, an email, an address, a phone, a website, and a company, some company data. So plenty of data to work with. Um, if we inspect the, our network tab, we can also see in the response in the head that there are a number of different headers associated with the response. So um, there's no need for you to understand all of these, but I'll go, I'm going to be referring to some of them um, when I'm doing the exercises. Uh, headers for those of you who are less familiar with these REST APIs are, um, they contain metadata, a description about the response, specific characteristics of the response. It's not the actual data, but it's other information that might be useful for the receiver of this response. So the party that sent the request. Uh, for example, one of the most important ones is the content type header, which, whoops, this one, which tells the receiver, the recipient, of this response, 
uh, what data type the actual response is in. And so in this case, it tells the receiver of the response, the data uh, that you see is in a JSON format and the used character set is UTF-8. So that's our API. Um, it's as simple as this. Um, most of the time, uh, we are going to be retrieving some data and verifying some specific properties of this response. So I've, what I've prepared here um, for this session are a number of simple coding challenges that I'm going to talk you through in this session. So you'll see uh, what's going on. Um, by the way, I'm using PyCharm. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the IDE, it's um, basically IntelliJ, but for Python. Um, it's one of the many IDEs that you can use for Python. It's definitely not the only one. I'm not going to say that it's the best one. I just happen to like it very much. So that's why I'm using it here. Um, by the way, just checking AJ, is this readable or should I increase the font size for you? No, this is good. I can read it. That's good. Then I'm going to assume that everybody's watching this webinar can also read it fine. Exactly. If not, by the way, um, if it's hard to read, the all of the code that I'll be showing, so both the exercises and the answers to all of the exercises, I'm going to hide them. I don't want to give them all away. I don't want to spoil these, the surprises here. They can be found on GitHub as well. So if you go to this URL, uh, this contains the exact code that I'll be working with in this session. That's great. Together yeah. with, yeah, with a bit of descriptions on how to actually install the dependencies and run the code for those of you not as familiar with Python as, uh, and not yet that much familiar with Python. Oh. Awesome, so what I've prepared here is just a Python module exercises.py with a number of tests. And as of now, when I'm running these tests, they all fail because there's a lot of work we still need to do. What I've prepared is basically they are empty tests. The only thing that, or not empty because there is an assertion statement in there, but the only thing they do is just assert false. And what we're going to do here is, um, make them and make these tests pass. So I want these tests to pass. Let me quickly go into the settings and, oh, where's this again? Languages and drive. Boss, before we- I forgot I... where this is. Yeah, yeah sure, uh, AJ, go ahead. So before we take a deep dive into uh, API testing using PyCharm, so I have a, a generic question to ask from you. Sure. So uh, what suddenly happened, you know, like why uh, all the organizations are uh, focusing more on API testing rather than, you know, uh, focusing more on our traditional functional testing? So you want to know why? Um, well, it, it's, um, so what we've seen traditionally in test automation is that people started to write tests that replicate what an end user does, how an end user interacts with an application. And those are important tests because we need to know that an end user can perform specific actions with, uh, in an application through the graphical user interface. However, um, for a lot of tests, it's not the, it's definitely not the most efficient way to uh, get the information that you're looking for. So um, if I want to check that an end user can do something with an application on the graphical user interface, then I need um, 
if I want to write some automation that checks that, I need a tool that operates on the graphical user interface. However, that's just a small subset of um, the whole suite of tests that you want to perform. So um, a lot of times you'll be focusing on uh, testing business logic, testing algorithms, testing uh, the implementation of decision tables, business rules, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and unless your application is incredibly badly built, um, you will not need the uh, the, actual, the graphical user interface does not play a role in the implementation of that logic of those algorithms of those business rules. Mm -hmm. um, they are often exposed via APIs. So if you want to check that business logic, it often makes much more sense to test that at, at the API level. Um, also, app systems uh, com applications are becoming much more distributed uh, mm -hmm. nowadays. So instead of having this one big monolith that does pretty much everything, we have applications that are built out of uh, a lot of different components, microservices often, um, that, all, uh, that all perform one specific task and mm -hmm. communicate with one another via APIs. So there's a lot more uh, potential, a lot more, uh, many more opportunities to write tests at the API level. And these API level tests, they are, um, they just run much quicker. They're easier to write than, than, than tests, for example, using Selenium or Cypress or Play. Mm -hmm. um, they run a lot, uh, they run a lot faster. So they give you that, that feedback that you're looking for in your testing mm -hmm. uh, a lot quicker compared to these relatively slow and uh, hard to maintain tests that run, a run against the graphical user interface. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, so let's get started. So the first challenge that I have is to have my, um, write some code that uh, performs the actual get request that we've been doing here. So it uh, re actually retrieve this data and check that the response status code, so the HTTP status code, that is the first indication of um, was this request processed successfully, um, is equal to 200. So what we want to do is perform an HTTP get to a specific endpoint, uh, capture the response, and check that the response status code is equal to 200. Now, the way, so we're going to replace this assert false with an actual test that makes sense. And the way to do that is to simply So my first line of code here is a call to the requests library, which is not there, but um, it is part of my project. So all I need to do is import it to make the library available in the module that I'm working in. Mm -hmm. And this request library has a number of utility methods for each of the HTTP verbs. So get, post, put, patch, delete, etc. Uh, uh, and one of the ways to call it, the, the, the most straightforward way to call this get method is by passing it the endpoint that you want to get, the, the, where the data resides that you want to retrieve. Um, and this method, this get method, um, it returns the entire response. So the HTTP response um, as an object, as a Python object, and uh, I'm going I'm going to temporarily store that in a variable called response. So this single line of code um, is everything you need uh, in Python to create an HTTP request, to actually send that HTTP request 
uh, that HTTP GET to the endpoint that you specified, and to capture the response or store it in a variable. That's it. This is all you need to do. And that's exactly what I meant when I said, well, request uh, is simple but powerful. Uh, this single line of code, this single line of code um, creates the HTTP request again, sends it, captures captures the response and stores it in this response variable. Um, and the only thing we need to add now to make this a meaningful test is uh, the second line here says check that the response status code is equal to 200. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, with PyTest, uh, you create an assertion using the assert keyword. And the only thing we need to check is uh, this response object has a number of properties. So the content, the text, the headers, but also the one that we're looking for here, which is the status code. And all I need to do is check that this is equal to 200 to make this a meaning. Uh, uh, again, this is the hello world of API testing, uh, performing a call and checking the, uh, the response status code. But these two lines, line seven and eight that you see on the screen here are everything we need to make this work. So if we now run the test again, we can see that even though there's seven tests that are still failing, uh, there's one test that passed now. And that's our first test. So at Py, the way PyTest outputs this here is with a little green dot. Uh, and that is our first test. So just add to, and, and, and that's, by the way, that's just a very good practice to uh, to do. I think with all of your tests is uh, once you've written a test and it passes the first time, um, have, start doubting yourself. Uh, I do, um, because now I want to know, uh, is, okay, is it really this straightforward and this easy? And just uh, try and make the test fail just so you know it checks the right thing so and i've changed the expected status code from 200 to 201 and now i've got eight failed tests again which means that the 200 is actually being checked being verified properly and um, this test is ready to go this test is done um so that's the first one um so what we've done now here is, uh, again, uh, using PyTest and the request library, uh, perform an HTTP GET to a specific endpoint, uh, capture the response, and check that the status code of the response is equal to 200. Let's see what else we can do here. So the second thing that I want to show you is, um, Again, submit the same get request. I've um, separated, I, I'm putting this in a separate test on purpose. So you can follow along with each step. Um, so I'm making a new HTTP call in every single test. If you say, well, I just wanted to, add, I want to add a second assertion to the same test, that's fine but I'm not going to do that in this demonstration. So I'm going to write, uh, to perform the, the, the same HTTP call again, uh, but in a different test. So the first thing we need to do again is perform that same API call. Um, the second property that I want to check uh, in the response is to see if that content type header that we saw earlier here, so this one, um, has the uh, has a value that's equal to the expect the value that we expect. So in this case, I want to check that the content type header is equal to application JSON. Now, in the previous exercise, the previous example, we've um, inspected the status code. Um, 
what I'm going to expect, what I'm going to expect now is the headers. And that's probably not a surprise here, uh, because uh, the headers uh, and, the, uh, and in, in this case, uh, the way request the, the request library stores this is uh, this is just a regular Python dictionary. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a dictionary is, it's a collection of key value pairs where the keys are the names of the headers and the values are their respective header values. So, and the way to, uh, oops, I am, By the way, I'm incredibly inconsistent with single and double quotes in Python. Luckily, Python is very forgiving. Um, so what I've done here, I'm performing that same API call, but instead of the status code, I'm now checking that um, the content type header mm -hmm. is equal to application JSON with the character set of UTF-8. So these um, straight bracket, and this is the way uh, in Python to retrieve um, the value corresponding to a specific key from a Python dictionary. Mm -hmm. um, and I run this test. We now got two passing tests. Mm -hmm. um, just to show you what's happening, let's change this eight to nine. It fails again because well, okay, it's UTF I eight, not UTF nine. Another exception that you might have is uh, that you might receive is well, I'm referring to the actual header by its name. So, what if I uh, enter a name that's not there? What if I try to retrieve a header that that, that doesn't exist? Yeah, so let's change the name of that one. This will actually also throw or raise yeah, in, in, in Python terms, uh, this make my test fail. This is a key error. And a, if you see a key error in your Python test, it means that you're trying to retrieve a value in a dictionary by a key that doesn't exist. So um, the request library converts the collection of response headers to a Python dictionary for you. But if you want to retrieve the, um, if you try to retrieve a header, a key, a header name that does not exist, um, your test will raise a key error. Yeah. So let's make, uh, do this, change this back to um, content type again, and we have a passing test. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we've checked status code, we've checked response headers. Um, let's have a look at the actual data. So the first, the third uh, challenge that I've come up with is checking that the response contains a field called name. I'm not interested in the value yet. I just want to know that this name field exists. So again, I'm just copying the response. Boss, um, uh, yes. Uh, I think there is a need of increasing the font. Could you do that? Absolutely. There we go. Better? Much better, of course. Excellent. Excellent, no problem. Yeah. So um, to be able to access the data that's, uh, or, con or, or uh, to be able to access the data in a convenient way uh, using the request library, there's one extra step that we need to take uh, compared to these previous to uh, these previous two challenges. Um, by default, 
the response object will uh, contain the response data in just a, a raw byte stream. Uh, and that's because uh, REST supports a lot of different data, uh, data types, really. So a REST API can return data in JSON, but also in XML, or um, it returns Word documents or MP3 files or video files, stuff like that. So REST isn't tied to a specific data format. Mm -hmm. um, but also uh, the uh, the JSON data format is very is very similar to Python dictionaries again. So um, a JSON is basically a, a, a JSON document is basically a list of key value pairs where the keys are the element names and the values are the element values. Um, and request uh, has a convenience method called JSON. So what this what this method does, so what you see here on line 22, is it extracts the data in yeah. the response body and it tries to convert it into, again, a Python dictionary. Mm -hmm. So that's what this JSON method does. So, uh, so obviously this will only work if the response data is actually JSON. If it's XML or if it's JSON that cannot be parsed, this will, oops, I didn't want to do that. This will again raise an error. But uh, in this case, because our example API returns JSON, um, we can use this JSON method to transform the JSON string into a Python dictionary. And we can do uh, assertions on that in much the same way. So if I want to check that this response body, uh, which uh, object, which is now again a Python dictionary with all the JSON elements that are in the um, that are in the response body, um, contains a name element. Mm -hmm. This is all you need to do: check that uh, the, the 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 key name is a member of this response body Python dictionary. Again, just check, or actually check, yeah. Now we've only got two passing ones. So aim is not in there, but name definitely is. So we now know that this response body field, this response body field exists. Um, most of the time, uh, you don't want to just check that the, uh, that the, the field exists. You also want to check on its value. And uh, that's the same as we saw with the headers. It's just a, we need this extra step to convert our body to a Python dictionary. But once we've done that, uh, we can just uh, um, access the value with this, uh, with this um, uh, square bracket notation. Um, Put the name of uh, put the name of the field that we're interested in there, and that'll return the corresponding. Mm -hmm. So now we've got four passing tests. We're moving along nicely here. Uh, so if you just want to check that a field exists, you can do it like this. And if you're actually interested, so this implicitly checks that the field exists because. If the field doesn't exist, there's no way to access its value. Uh, oops. And again, this raises a key error if uh, for some reason this field cannot be found. Uh, but in this case, it passes. So that's good. Um, so this was a top level field, this name field. There's also a name field as part of this company field. So uh, the value of this company field is again a 
JSON string with three fields, the name, the catchphrase, and the BS field. So say we're not interested in this name, but in this name, for example. So this is something that I cannot pronounce, something like that. Um, if you want to check on that, um, we can do that by first accessing the value of the company field because um, a Python dictionary is a, again, a collection of key value pairs and the values, um, they can be just strings or integers or uh, Booleans, for example, but they in itself, they can be dictionaries again. So, and that, so this JSON method, it, this converts the entire JSON field, even if it has nested elements of them and, and with lists in there or uh, where the value of an element is again, uh, a JSON string in and of itself, uh, it'll just convert it into a dictionary inside of a dictionary. So what this returns is basically a, a new dictionary with three elements in there, name, catchphrase, and BS. So, and if or. So, yeah, so because it resolves from left to right, uh, this will extract the value of the company field, which is a dictionary again. And then I can access the name field that's in there and say, Roma, Guerra. Roma. Yay, five, just to check that we're actually checking the right thing. It does not like this. Cool. So um, if you have nested um, response body fields and you can just drill down into uh, the structure using this square bracket notation. Um, if there's a uh, an array in there, uh, and you say, "Well, I'm interested in the um, in the first element in that array," and you can uh, and one way to do that is to access it by its index, which you can again do using the square brackets, but um, with an integer, uh, passing it an integer to to point to an element at a specific index in that in that list. But in this case, that's not necessary. Um, boom, boom, boom. A slightly different request. So this HTTP get returns the data for the user with ID one. This one returns a list with the data for all of the users. So in this API, there are 10 of them, starting with ID one and ending with ID 10. So for example, if I want to check that, uh, there are actually 10, yeah, there are 10 users. I need to make sure that to call the right endpoint. This again is an HTTP get. Um, I can do that again by converting this uh, response to a Python dictionary and then just asserting that len is uh, a Python built-in function that returns the length or the number of objects in any type of collection. Mm -hmm. uh, so let, let's check. So we've now got six pass tests, which indicates that, well, the length of this response point is actually 10. Um, I don't need to point to a specific element in this response body here because the list is uh, at the root level. Um, it's also perfectly possible for JSON elements and the values of uh, the value of a JSON element can also be a uh, a list, 
uh, in this case, that's not true. The list is just the root element of this, uh, of this response body. And that's why we don't need to point to a specific element. But if there was a root level element called data, for example, and the value of that one was uh, of that data element uh, of the data field uh, was a list, uh, was a list in, in JSON, uh, you can simply point to that element uh, like we've done in the previous examples as well. Then just to make sure we're actually doing the stuff that we want to do here. I just, I just uh, uh, in case you haven't, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, I really like confirming that my tests actually do what I think that they do. Yeah. Um, so we've seen um, verifying status codes, verifying uh, response headers, verifying response body data. Um, let's see that uh, how to um, send data because these were all HTTP GET requests, uh, so requests. Uh, um, to retrieve data from an API provider. Um, often, uh, you'll also uh, want to test if the API provider is able to process data that you send to it in the correct, um, in the expected way. So um, our API, if you go to the, let's close this one. So there's a list of routes. So all HTTP methods are supported. Uh, the one I'm interested in here is this one. The, oops, the post to posts. So this one creates a new um, a new post. Uh, so a post is it just um, it's associated with a user. It has an ID in and of itself, uh, and it has a title and a body. So uh, it's a relatively simple JSON structure, it's a relatively simple data structure, uh, which saves me a lot of typing. And that's good. I like saving myself a lot of typing. Um, so the first thing we need to do now is um, create a new post and that is as simple as assigning a user ID to it. Uh, so this is uh, the way in Python to create a, um, a previous exercises is transformation string JSON document uh, into a dictionary. Uh, what I'm going to do now, because now I'm not retrieving data and, and checking it, but I'm, uh, I'm going to send data. I want to do uh, the serialization, so the, the, the other way around. So I'm creating a Python the API, uh, uh, and then I'll need a way to tell the request library to take that Python dictionary and convert it into an actual JSON payload. Uh, my post title and this one is my post body. Um, so in this API, I don't. So uh, even if I retrieve a post, it'll contain an ID. You don't actually need to send that to the API. So that's why the ID field's not in here because that's auto generated by the API provider itself. Um, in the previous examples, we used the get method because that resembles and corresponds to an HTTP get. But of course, you are going to use the uh, posts method. Again, Let's pass it uh, the endpoint. Um, 
But now we also need a way um, to uh, attach our Python dictionary, so the data that we want to send to this request. And in Python, that's as easy as using a named parameter called JSON. Um, and uh, as, it's as the value of this name parameter, you can pass in any Python dictionary. What requests will do for you is uh, basically the reverse process of what we've seen earlier. Right? It takes a Python dictionary and it transforms that automatically into a JSON string before sending it to the endpoint, before sending it to the provider. So you don't need to do that yourself. That's all being taken care of by the request library for you. Um, again, if this dictionary is incorrectly formatted, um, it'll raise an error. Um, if this is a valid Python dictionary, it'll come. So the, using the JSON, um, uh, the JSON name parameter, uh, that'll automatically convert this dictionary. Uh, to JSON for you. So, um, there's also the data named parameter, which you can also use, but this does not do the transformation from Python dictionary to, uh, to a JSON string. So you if your API accepts XML, for example, or plain text or something else. Um, so for example, if uh, is, uh, if I want to send this as data, I could just pass it here as uh, this one. And this will not do any conversion. So this will just pass the raw string that you've, uh, that you've created here um to the api endpoint but in this case uh, i like to uh, just create a python dictionary because that's easy and straightforward you can do that programmatically uh, th this one is hard coded but maybe it's uh, and you, yeah, you have a different way of constructing this this dictionary and all you need to do is pass it as a value to the JSON per, uh, using name parameters to the JSON parameter and request will try and convert this into actual JSON. Oops. Status code. And the typical status code for a successful HTTP post is A201. So let's see what this one does. It also passes. So this means that uh, even with just a few lines of code here, I've created my Python dictionary that, that um, uh, represents the JSON data that I want to send me uh, by co uh, converting this into actual JSON. Uh, I've posted that to the, and I've checked that the response status code is equal to two or one. Okay. Um, how are we doing for time, AJ? Could you repeat, Blas? How are we doing time-wise? How much time do I have left? No, no. Uh, you can continue uh, when you want. Uh, like, uh, of course, I know. Like, uh, you can continue for hours. But uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, no, just uh, second because we are and we're close to an hour already. I've got one. I've got one more. So um, it's not that much. I just wanted to check if there was still time to do this this uh, this final example because I think it's it's pretty interesting and powerful as well. I just wanted to check. Go ahead. Go ahead. We have ample of time. No worries. All right. Um, so the final thing that I want to show you again, as you rightfully said, AJ, we could go on for days here, um, but we're not going to do that. Yeah. 
one thing that uh, one thing that I definitely wanted to show, though, is, and that's because it's something that we see used so often in, um, especially testing at the API level, because again, APIs often expose business logic, uh, algorithms, business rules, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, what you often want to do is, and because if, if I want to check the implementation of a business rule of, or a piece of business logic, I typically need more than one test case or example to do that. So I need more than one uh, set of values to pass to it. So uh, if, if I want to check... Uh, an algorithm that calculates a train fare based on uh, the distance someone's traveling and their age, eh? because maybe there's a reduction for people under 18 and people over 65, for example. Um, I need mo eh, to be able to completely test that. I need more than one test case. So I, I need a test case where I've got a person who's under 18. I've got a test case where people where are people between 18 and 65, and I have test cases for people over 65, for example. Okay. Um, so the straightforward and ugly way to do this is to just write multiple tests that do um, that do the same uh, that do the uh, add that that basically repeat the same logic, call the same API endpoint or endpoints, just with different sets of data. Um, that's the ugly way to do it because you then potentially end up with three, four, five, 20, 50 different tests that all exercise the same application logic just with different sets of data. Uh, and in this example, the tests are short. It's just two or three lines of code. Um, but in practice, that, that can often, and because the examples, the applications are bigger there, that can be 10, 20, 30 lines of code times 50 is 1,500 lines of code and with a lot of duplication. Um, there's a more elegant way to do that. And I must say that's not a feature specifically of requests, but more of a feature of the underlying unit testing framework. So in this case of PyTest. Um, if you were to do this in Java, it's, it's a feature of JUnit, the test and G. If you want to do this in C Sharp, uh, the, the, these are features of NUnit or MS Test or XUnit. Uh, 